one of the rarest things in the exhibition altogether, and this is some French modern says McBride. It's a book that Duchamp put together in, 19, in the early 1920s. It came out in 1922. Uh, it's extremely rare. I don't think that there are more than maybe 10 copies in existence that I know of. There are photographs inside by Charles Sheeler, and these are texts by Henry McBride. Henry McBride was one of the leading critics from the time of the Armory Show, roughly to the 1940s. He wrote for the Dial later on in his life. He wasn't a particularly profound writer, but he liked the right stuff, and Duchamp liked him for liking it. Uh, so he decided to gather his essays that were published in various newspapers, reprint them in this fashion, but there's a little like secret that goes through this that you can only understand if you leaf through the pages. The writing starts one size and each page it gets bigger and bigger and bigger till you get to the last page and there's only fragments of words across the page. And then after that it drops to a minuscule type that you can't even read. I don't know if you read it as I do, but something that has a slow build up of a crescendo that explodes and then collapses on the last page. In my endless quest to find out what the meaning of the large glass was, that was my, one of my first attempts, I realized that I needed to know these notes and know them really well. And I read all of them, tried to organize them even in what I thought was the order in which they were made, because you see the notes are scattered. Uh, when Duchamp made the notes for the green box, he he, he collected the, all of his notes and then produced them in a facsimile form. He used the same type of ink that he made the original note on and, and also tried to find the very same paper. Once it was printed, he wanted them to resemble the original notes, so they had to be cut because he made these notes on scraps of paper, whatever was available to him. So he used templates and cut each one of them individually. He just threw them in and at random so that chance would be the order, and they are always, of course, in a different order. It's incumbent upon you, if you want to classify them and order them, to put them in a kind of order for understanding how the large glass works, because all of these notes were specifically about that one work. The large glass, of course, is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It has a bachelor section below and a bride above it, and you just have to figure out how those bachelors, there are nine of them at the bottom, have some form of unification with the bride above. After Duchamp completed the making of the green box, he embarked upon this project of reproducing his most important works uh, into another album. He wanted them probably at first just to be kind of either separate plates in a box or maybe in a book format, but he got carried away over the years. In the mid-1930s, as he was having them made, it just seemed to get more and more ambitious. Uh, and this is the result. It's called uh, the Boitin Valise. The part where he got carried away is when he made the large glass and standing next to it is the Air of Paris, the Underwood typewriter cover, and the urinal at the bottom. That format, by the way, no one noticed, was very important to the meaning of Duchamp's work. Uh, and this was discovered by William Canfield. He noticed that the Paris air, which is supposed to be an ampule of air that's broken open in Paris, captures Paris air and is resealed, has a thematic element that relates to the bride right next to it. Because the bride, that upper register of the large glass, has three openings in it. Those openings were determined by letting a piece of cheesecloth blow in the wind in a window frame and he captured its irregular shape. So the bride is this ethereal element that has air blowing through her, so that captures her. And in the middle, the division between the two in his notes, he said that that represented the clothing of the bride. And as she gets stripped, she arouses the bachelors below, and of course, appropriately, there's an Underwood typewriter cover. That's one of his ready-mades from 1917-18, which as you can see, has the word Underwood written right across it. It's a plain typewriter cover, uh, but it has maybe added meaning because we know that in 1917, Duchamp and his good friend Henri Pierre Rocher were having a kind of love triangle with Beatrice Wood. So if you think of that as Underwood and you look under it, you're looking under Wood's dress. 
So then she becomes this metaphor for the bride. And below, of course, he puts the urinal. And what better representation of a male identity do you need? Because then you have the bachelors right next to it. So that arrangement ended up being a very important component within the glass, which required him, of course, rendering these things in 3D. But they are miniature. They are smaller versions of the objects themselves, naturally, as is everything that's included within the valise. If you look carefully over the surface, you'll see it's signed Marcel Duchamp. And this was owned by a guy named Vincent Romano, who uh, was a, an artist. You know, he, he was a guard in the Museum of Modern Art, and maybe some of you know this. They employed almost exclusively just artists to work in the museum in the 1960s. Well, Jackson Pollock was a guard there. So anyway, he was an artist trying to build, he said, a museum. And the museum was going to be entirely made of toys. And I love what he called it. He called it the Musee Luini, for, for Mussolini. Um, but, and he saw Duchamp coming, and he said he had been to the toy store that afternoon, and he saw Duchamp work, walking through the gallery. So he reached in his pocket, says he totally at random, pulls out this toy, hands it to Duchamp and said, would you sign this? And Duchamp presumably turns to him and said, look, I, don't, I can't just sign anything. So that means it probably had to be after 1964, because Schwartz wouldn't let Duchamp just sign anything after that, because it, the editions had come out. But he said, oh, but you wouldn't consider signing this because look what it does. And he pulls this down, the little tab. The little boy sticks out his tongue and his eyes move around. And Duchamp started laughing and says, do you have a pencil? <laughs> so that guy pulls a pencil out and he signs it. Now, the reason it ends up being an interesting work is because you do have to ask yourself, to what extent is this by Duchamp? And to what extent is it a work by this artist who handed it to him and asked him to sign it? And because of that, uh, however, you can make a strong argument for the fact that what is a bottle rack if Duchamp doesn't sign it? It's a bottle rack, right? You need his signature on it or it isn't, doesn't exist as a work of art. This is a work that Duchamp made in 1959. It's called Oe Gaz, à tous les étages, because if you look at the side here, there's a plaque that's taken off a French building that says water and gas at all levels. Um, I became fascinated with this particular work because of various factors, one being that it was again a published work, but one that now comes at the end of his life. It's the first major monograph on Duchamp. It's written by Robert Lebel, a French art critic, and he analyzes the work from beginning to end and reproduces almost all of it, but it was Duchamp's decision to design and how the design went about for the deluxe editions. He had nothing to do with the writing inside, though he had a lot to do with the layout, which is very eccentric and unusual, because in many cases you'll have reproductions overlapping uh, other works of art. What fascinates me about this particular box is a sort of discovery that I made about it, and it wasn't even my discovery. It was an observation made by uh, Rhonda Shear, uh, who is a, a collector of Duchamp's work, uh, and she just mentioned it casually, but didn't want to take it as far as I took it. Uh, she thought that the work Tomb, uh, that's the long horizontal painting that Duchamp made for Catherine Dreyer, the last painting that he made in his life, was the secret to understanding this work because it is reproduced on the inside spine. Tomb comes from the French word tomb merde which means you bore me or you bore the hell out of me. Uh, but, it, but he only used the first part of the word, so it's T-U space M apostrophe. It could be you bore me, it could be even something much worse. He didn't actually like his painting. He didn't like that it was a conglomeration of all other earlier thoughts. He spoke out against his own picture. But if you say the word tomb in French, it's just like the word tomb. On that level, then suddenly this box had a whole different meaning for me because it is, in effect, Marcel Duchamp's tomb, where all of his works would be encased in a box, like a casket. He, specifically for this edition, designed that cut profile portrait that you see. And the reason I thought I understood this maybe better than most people is because I was brought up Catholic, and if you were brought up a Catholic in the 1950s and 60s, then you probably would remember still to this day many of your relatives lying in a coffin. As a little kid, you walk into the funeral parlor and you see your uncle or your aunt or your cousin there with 
in profile, and that's how you remember them for the rest of your life. And this is a project at the end of Duchamp's life. I'm convinced that he did this for a number of reasons. The observation that Rhonda Shearer made is that in every single copy, in order to protect the large glass from the component that holds it in place, he included, what you can just see here at the bottom, a piece of thin tissue paper, but if you look at the tissue paper, you'll notice that there's spider webs on it. Why would spider webs be in the box, unless it's the box where you get entombed? And the kicker in the end is that it's called oe gaz, water and gas, on all levels. That was a sign that was used by the French to advertise on the outside that water and gas is available on all levels in this building. It also reminded firemen and policemen what there was in that building. But water and gas on all levels, what are you when you die? You decompose into water and gases and on all levels, including six feet underground. So in a way, that is his summation, the summation that he made to encapsulate all of his previous ideas into a single object.